Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Hey, I'm Joel. Welcome to Crossroads. I am the teaching pastor here. If you guys are saying, who the heck is that guy? I've been gone for about three weeks. Uh, I've been in Florida and filling in for a pastor there just north of West Palm Beach for a few weeks. He was gone and he, he actually hadn't taken this long of a break in 20 years of pastoring. So it was kind of cool to be able to give him that opportunity. So uh, I'm back. I'll be here all month doing this series um, called Big Dreams and Other Disasters. Everybody laughs at that title. What's the deal? I guess some of us have, ever, have had that feeling of having a big dream and it turning into a disaster, right? So, uh, hey, I want to tell you something real quick. This is, this is extra bonus material, but, um, you know, it's going to be all right. I've talked to a lot of people this morning that are just, man, it's, it's getting hard. And I, I think for a lot of people... Um, the year last year, we, we played the good, good soldier for the whole year, and we shouldered it, and we're like, we can make it through this, and now we're just getting tired, and we're like, I'm done with this everything. Like, I'm just done with it all. And, and, and here's the thing. Um, you know, that, that song we just sang is such a bizarre song. Like, if you think about the words of it, it's a weird song. Um, when it comes from Ezekiel, there's this verse in Ezekiel where this guy, he's a prophet. His name's Ezekiel. If you ever had a friend named Ezekiel, that's where you got it from. Um, he was a prophet in the Bible. And, and God takes this prophet and he takes him to this valley of dry bones. And he says, hey, um, I want you to tell these dry bones to, to, hear, to come to life. And, and the guy's like, well, they're dead. Like, everything there is dead. Like, if it's at, bone, if it's at bones, like, it's dead right? It's gone. Like, you ever seen The Princess Bride where he says, he's only partially dead, right? No, it's like fully dead if it's bones, right? And so he prophesies over the bones and he said to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Anyways, the long story short is, all of a sudden he hears this rattling sound and these bones start to come back together and then all this muscle starts to show up on the bones and a little bit of fat. And before you know it, this whole thing has been put back together and all these dry bones have come back to life. And I think that's a, that, what that's a picture of. He's talking to Israel there, but I think this is something that carries over to us is that, listen, it ain't dead until God says it's dead. Amen. As we used to say, it ain't over till... Or that. Yeah, that too. <laughs> Fill it in with yours. <laughs> but I just want to say, man, stay encouraged. It's been a rough year for so many of us. Man, it's been a rough 18 months. But here's the thing, guys. We're coming out of this. And you're going to come out of this stronger and better for it. In fact, I think that, you know, oftentimes when, when stuff is just has to, is forced to kind of slow down and stop for a while, it gets time to rejuvenate. And it starts to create even greater things than it did before. And one of the things that God asked of the children of Israel is to let the land rest periodically. Give it a whole year of rest. And when they didn't do it, their crops didn't go well. In fact, at one point, they got sent off to Babylon for disobeying God. And the, 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 if you do the numbers, the time that they were in Babylon was the number of years they were supposed to have given their land rest. So sometimes God will say, look, if you're not going to slow down, I'm going to do it for you. So take advantage of that. And I know it's been a rough year. We've, we've lost a lot of loved ones. But here's the thing. We'll come out of this stronger. You've got to keep the eternal perspective, realizing we're not living for this anyways. We don't fix our eyes. That's what it says. It says we don't lose heart because we know outwardly we're wasting away, but inwardly we're being renewed day by day for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory that's beyond all comparison. So we fix our eyes not on what's seen, for what's seen is passing away, but we fix our eyes on what's unseen. Because what's unseen, that's eternal. And when we stay focused on what's eternal, realizing, man, it stinks everything that's happening around here. Yes, but there's something bigger we're living for. And that's part of what we're going to be talking about over the next week, uh, next few weeks. Um, this, this idea of big dreams and other disasters. We're going to look at a story of a guy in the Bible who God gave a big, impossible dream. And we're going to look at some of the things he did right and a lot of the things he did wrong. But here's the cool thing about it. In spite of the things that he did wrong, God still brought his dream to pass. And here's what I know about everybody in here, right? Every one of us, we've got something in our life right now. You've got a dream for your future, for your family, for your finances. And as you're looking at it, you would say probably something like this. There's no way that could happen. 
Maybe you've been looking at your, the, the situation with your finance and you're like, every time we almost crawl out of this hole, something else hits. The car breaks down, the house situation, the, the hail, whatever it is. It's like one thing after another. And you're looking at it and you're going, there's no way that could ever happen. But there's still this hope within you that says, man, maybe the Lord will provide for us. And that hope is just kind of simmering there. Maybe you're looking at your relationship with your son or daughter and saying, man, I wish we could get it back to the way it used to be. But there's just too much water under the bridge, too, too much hurt, too many things have been damaged. Maybe you're looking at your marriage saying the same thing. And I just don't see how it could possibly happen. Well, here's what I'm here to tell you this morning. Over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about God working in our lives to bring big dreams that he puts in us to, to come to pass. But here's the thing. When the big dream comes to pass, it will be because of him, not because of you. Amen. Because here's the thing. When God promises something, he brings it to completion. But this is where things get tricky, OK? Because when God promises something, he brings it to completion. But we can either make it easier on ourselves or we can make it harder on ourselves. Because here's the thing. In life, God develops us into who he wants us to be through suffering and challenges and difficulty and resistance. I wish he developed us into who he wanted us to be by letting us just eat Twinkies. Here, have another Twinkie. Wow, I feel so much more holy now. It doesn't go down that way. We grow through challenges and suffering. And you know this because some of you have been through some really hard, hard stuff. And you look back and you go, I don't ever want to do that again. But man, I learned a whole lot through that. And in fact, some ways it was actually good. I needed to learn that. But I don't ever want to do it again. But, but here's the thing. That's the way God has chosen to work in our world. Even Jesus didn't get out without some suffering. And he was perfect. It says, there's this weird verse that says, Jesus learned obedience through what he suffered. And you go, what? Why would the perfect God need to learn obedience? I don't understand all the theological implications of it. But the bottom line is this, we grow through suffering. So there's some suffering in life that's necessary. But here's the thing. There's a whole lot of suffering in life that's not necessary. It comes when we go against principles and patterns that God has put into place. Because just like, you know, gravity is a principle. If you jump off a building, you know what's going to happen. You're not going to soar into the heights. You're going to fall and you're going to splatter. And, and there's spiritual principles that are just like that. And here's the thing. You can love God really have a passionate, sincere heart, but you can do things that are against his principles and you end up getting unnecessary suffering in your life. And you go, why is this happening to me? And you come to Pastor Marcus, Pastor Marcus, why is this happening? And he's like, well, what did you think was going to happen when you did that? He's more compassionate than me. He'd actually say something really loving. But <laughs> that's really what happens a lot of times that we go, why is this happening? Well, a lot of it's because, me and here's the thing, some of you, you just didn't know. You just didn't know that was a spiritual principle. So one of the beautiful things about reading your Bible and understanding the Word of God is this is the powerful thing about the Word of God, okay? The Word of God, the Bible, all of it, the front and the back cover, all of it, everything in between the Old Testament and New Testament is the framework for how to live in harmony with the seen and the unseen realities of your existence. Because there's the stuff you see that you've got to live in harmony with, but just as important as the stuff you don't see that you've got to live in harmony with. And the Bible gives you the formula, the, the, the pattern to, 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 dwell, to live by, to live in harmony with that. So here's the thing. When God gives you a big dream, he's the one that's going to bring it to pass. But you can do some things to really make it hard on yourself. So we're going to talk over the next few weeks about how to avoid some of the disasters that we commonly make when we're pursuing a dream in our hearts and we operate against the principles that God has put into place. And there's this guy that we're going to look at. And as I read his story, you go, wow. This dude made a bunch of mistakes. If you think you've made some dumb mistakes, this guy might have you beat, OK? So this should be encouraging for all of us. Like, I don't know. We're going to look at the story of Abraham. Abraham's story is right in Genesis. And Abraham is considered the father of the faith, right? But if you look at his life, he made some really dumb mistakes. Some of them were disasters. And yet in the end, he's called one who was faithful to God which I think is good news for all of us because you probably dragged yourself in here this morning and maybe some aren't, aren't, you aren't feeling very good about yourself. You did some stuff this week that, man, it just made you feel dirty. You feel weak. That's the thing about sin. Sin just makes you feel weak. 
It makes you feel, ugh, ugh. And then you're like, I'm never going to do that again. And then you do it again. You're like, ugh, why did I do that again? And you just feel weak. And everything God asks of us is to make us strong. He's not asking you to do these things that he puts out there just because he wants to see if you'll, you know, if you'll comply and if he can control you. He's saying, I, I made this world. I know how it functions. I know how it operates. If you'll do what I say, it'll go really good for you. But if you don't, you end up banging your head against the wall over and over again. And, and eventually we figure it out. So we're going to look at Abraham. We're going to see if we can figure out some things we can avoid on the way to the dream coming to pass. Because here's the thing. I believe the dream God put in your heart to restore that relationship with your kids, restore that relationship with your spouse, to get you your job back, to get a new job possibly, to get your finances in line. That's a dream I believe he put in your heart to be more generous. And we're going to try and make it as easy as possible to get to that place. Because here's the thing, it's a long journey. There are no overnight success stories. I have some friends that they, they're really starting to hit it big and somebody came to them and said, yeah, you're an overnight success story. And they're like, yeah, 14 years overnight success story. And a lot of times we, we, we want life to be kind of like microwave popcorn. We want instant results. Like you put the popcorn in, two, two minutes later, you have some nice fluffy popcorn. But it doesn't work that way. Life is more like a garden where you plant the seed and then it takes a while for the seed to pop up and then it, it produces. But, but a lot of times what we want is like, I had a guy came on a, a hike with me one time and he told me, he said, man, it took me 37 years to look this bad. <laughs> he was kind of overweight and stuff. He's like, but this hike has made me realize I need to get into shape. And he said, and I realize also it's, it took me 37 years to get here. It's not going to be overnight. You can't just pop in the popcorn and be, be in shape overnight. And a lot of times we want things to be fixed instantly, but it's this slow process of God bringing the dream to pass. And we think he's not making it happen because it's happening slower than we want. But here's the thing. A lot of times we've planted some seeds. For example, people all the time, pastor, pastor, I need you to help my marriage. Can you meet with me tonight? I'm like, well, no, I can't. I'm hanging out with my family tonight. Well, but pastor, pastor, and I said, listen, it took you 27 years to mess up your marriage. We're not going to fix it tonight. It's going to have, it's going to take quite a few years to get things back in order. And you need to come to grips with that. It's a slow process of turning that ship. And there's so many things in our lives that we want it to be like popcorn. And God says, no, listen, I want your dream to come to pass, but you're going to have to be really patient and you're going to have to make consistently good decisions. And that's where we get tired. <laughs> but I'm tired of that. I, I, I want my instant popcorn. I want my instant better marriage. I want my instant restored relationship with my kids. I want my instant removal of this thing around me here that's bothering me. Uh, I want that. And God says, okay, I have a dream for you, but it's going to take some time. And if you look at the story of Abraham that we're going to look at today, man, it took some time with him. In fact, when you start off with this story, this is how it goes down. So the Lord said to Abraham, I want you to go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. He put this dream, this calling in Abraham to do something bigger than himself. And I'm going to bless you and make your name great so that, they, that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham went out as the Lord told him. And that's where Abraham got it right. When God puts a dream in your heart, he's not going to give you all the steps, okay? And here's why I'm convinced he doesn't give us all the steps. Because if he gave you all the steps and laid them out beforehand, you'd try and take shortcuts. I know us. We're, we're shortcut people, aren't we? We said, if God said, you're going to need to do this, 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 and this, you'd be like, well, I don't think I actually need those two middle ones. So you'd try and skate around it. And he'd be like, no, nope, you're shortcutting the process. And you can't shortcut the process because it's a long journey. So he gives us one step at a time and he says, I need you to move forward in a direction, but I'm not going to give you all the whole directions along the way. It's going to be on a need to know basis. I used to lead these hikes. We would do four months. I've told you all this before, but we used to do four months in Asia and four months in Central America. And the people that would come on the trips with me, they thought I had the whole thing all planned out, but I didn't. I had a one-way ticket booked usually. And they'd be like, well, what are we doing next week, Joel? And I'd be like, that's not a need to know basis. And I'm like, Lord, help me. I need to know. What are we going to do? Because I didn't know, but I found man, the, the older I get, the more I realize. That's how God works most of the time. He says, okay, you want a restored marriage? I'm going to take you there if you'll do whatever I say, but this, this, you got to take the steps one at a time because you can't shortcut any of the process to get where I want you to go. And he knows where he needs to get you to go. So he sends Abraham out and Abraham just starts going, right? 
But here's, here's where things go south. Abraham starts making some mistakes. In fact, I, I identified four mistakes we're going to look at in the life of Abraham. The first one I see is, is Abraham had, had this thing about passivity. You know what passivity is? It's not doing something when you know you should do something. And a lot of times, one of our biggest mistakes that we make is we just kind of let things slide and we compromise in areas that we know we shouldn't let it slide, but we let it slide because it's easier to let it slide. And it's not worth having that conversation with her again because it'll turn into a fight. And Abraham, check this out. When it says he set out, it says, now the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country and your kindred. You know what kindred means? It means your family and your father's house to the land that I will show you. So Abraham obeyed, right? He went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Yeah. Lot was family. When I lived in Mexico, you know, everybody would call everybody that was loosely related to them their primo. <laughs> I've heard that's the case around here too. It's like, yeah, see, it's mi primo, mi primo, primo, primo. So Lot, so this is what happens here, right? So Abraham, he says, God says, I need you to leave your family. And Lot comes along, he's like, hey, what's up? And he's like, hey, primo. He's like, I'm leaving. And the primo, and Lot's like, I won't come. <laughs> and Abraham has been specifically given orders, go away from your family. Now, here's the thing. Let me tell you all something hard, okay? Oftentimes, for you to get where God needs you to go, you're going to have to break ranks with your family, not because you don't love them, but because you've got to separate yourself from them because they're dragging you down from what God intends best for you. In fact, there's this one part where Jesus, somebody's about to, wants to follow him, and he's like, well, first let me, let me bury my father. And Jesus says some hardcore. He says, uh-uh. If you don't love your family more than me, you're not worthy to even follow me. Whoa. Whoa. That's intense. And here's the thing. Listen, we need to love our families. God gave them to us. But oftentimes, God's going to call you to step away from what's familiar. Family, familiar. That's where the word comes from. Because they're bringing you down, man. And you don't step away out of arrogance. You step away and you say, hey, I'm going to love you guys from a distance. But God has given me a purpose and a calling. And here's the thing. Lot was like, hey, I want to come. And Abraham should have said, sorry, bro. Cuz, sorry, primo. It's just me and God and the family on this one. I'll call you when we get set up if the Lord tells me to. But no, we've got to do this alone. And, and, but here's the thing. He let Lot come along. And as you read the rest of Abraham's story, Lot causes him major problems. Major problems. And I don't think it was that he disobeyed. I think it's just that he wasn't actively pursuing what God called him to do. And so passively, the family's like, hey, let us come along. He's like, okay. And then all of a sudden, his whole plan becomes way more complicated because he didn't cut ties with what was familiar. Familiar. That's a hard truth, right? Because we love our families. But there will be some times when you know your family's dragging you down. And we get worried. We're like, well, if I turn my back on my family, what if I need them? That's why you got to do it right. You don't just, I'm cutting y'all off. Y'all are bad, y'all are bad seed. You don't do that. You gently step away and you say, no, I've got to pursue what God's calling me to do. And, and you have to step away. But here's the thing. That's the, that's the mistake Abraham made. He passively kind of let it happen. Here's another pas passive thing Abraham did. Abraham's been promised he's going to have all these descendants. His wife can't have kids. So check this out. This story's just insane to me, okay? I know women and this story's insane. So Sarah, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children. She couldn't have kids. But she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abraham, hey, the Lord has kept me from having children. So why don't you go sleep with my slave, perhaps, and, and maybe I can build a family through her. God gave this promise. I'm going to give you kids. And his wife's not having the kids. So she's like, hey, you want to sleep with my maid? And Abraham's like, sounds good to me. Abraham agreed to what Sarah said. Passivity. Okay, sweetheart, if you really want me to. The younger, yeah, I'd be happy to sleep with your younger servant, right? Passivity. He let it slide. God made him a promise, and he, and he let his wife suggest something to him that seemed easier. And he didn't do something when he should have done something. What he should have said is, nope, I'm counting on the promise from God. And a lot of times that's what happens. Well-meaning people will say, well, here's how you can get there. And you go, 
Oh, okay. But you know that's a compromise from what God wants for you? Passivity. Then things get a little more intense. Here's some more of Abram's mistakes. Cowardice and deception. Check out this story. So Sarah, his wife, is really pretty. This is, we're just blowing through the story of Abraham today, okay? Um, his wife's really pretty, and, and there's this famine in the land. It means there's this drought, and so they don't have any food. So Abraham went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarah, I know what a beautiful woman you are. Every woman's like, oh, I love it when my husband calls me beautiful. But this is what he follows it up with. Listen to this. He said, I know you're so beautiful. When the Egyptians see you, they're going to say, this is his wife. Then they're going to kill me, but they'll let you live. So uh, say you're my sister uh, so that I will be treated well for your sake. For your sake? Yeah, maybe for his sake. Hmm, a little deceptive. And my life will be spared because of you. He basically says, I know you're like smoking hot and I know the Pharaoh's going to want you. Uh, so just lie about it and say that you're my sister. And then things get worse. You know what happens? Pharaoh actually takes his wife and he lets him. Abraham lets Pharaoh take Sarah. And then Sarah, you know, she passively goes along with it. It's this weird story. And then Pharaoh, all this bad stuff starts happening to him. And an angel actually shows up and says, you took another man's wife. And Pharaoh goes, whoa. So you know, because, because Abraham was passive and didn't stand up for his wife, God had to do it himself. He sends an angel down and then the, he says to Pharaoh, you did something wrong. And so Pharaoh comes to Abraham. He's like, what's the deal, man? Why did you lie that this was your sister? I wouldn't have taken her otherwise. It's because Abraham was a chicken. He didn't stand up for what he should have done. So God has to come in, and eventually the Pharaoh goes, well, hey, dude, you got to get out of my country. You're bad news. So he sends them off in the place they could have gone to get what they needed during the famine. They got kicked out of because of Abraham's cowardice and deception. Not to mention what's going on between him and his wife, Sarah, who is the one the promise is supposed to come through. And here's the really crazy thing. We read about him having that child through his maidservant, through Hagar. The child they had was a boy named Ishmael. Eventually, Sarah had her child. That child was named Isaac. And you know, those two brothers have been fighting for thousands of years because the children of Ishmael became what are known as the Arabs. The children of Isaac became known or what is good to call the Jews. And you know what the big problem is, the conflict in the Middle East right now? Arabs and Jews. And it was so much of it was because Abraham was passive. Okay. And he created long-term problems. Fourth thing, willful blindness is what I see with Abraham. So there's this, Abraham, he's got his cousin Lot, right? Or his primo Lot. And um, Lot is, the, the Lot really caused him some major problems. We're going to look at this a little bit more. And the crazy thing is, God didn't actually fulfill the promise to Abraham until Lot was out of the picture. There's something there. So Lot is living in this really bad town, two towns called Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and Abraham knows it's bad, okay? How do we know it's bad? Because you're about to see this interaction that's going to happen. And, and Sodom is so bad, but Abraham's primo, Lot, is living in this. And Abraham doesn't say anything. It's just over the hill from them. Well, God comes down and he's like, hey, Abraham, I'm going to fulfill my promise to you. Don't worry. Just be patient. But in the meantime, that town down there, Sodom and Gomorrah, they got to go. Like, I'm going to destroy them because they are so wicked and vile and evil. Like, they're just over the hill from you. And Abraham's like, no, no, don't, don't, listen, God, don't do that. And a lot of people say it was because of Abraham's compassion. I think it was because of Abraham's willful blindness. His, his unwillingness, his ignoring problems that were right in front of him. So here's what Abraham says. He's like, God, um, he, said, he said, God, if you have 50 people in the city that are righteous, will you not destroy it? And so God says, okay, if I find 50 people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. But then Abraham starts thinking, and he's like, I can't think of 50 people. Let's make a deal. What if we kick the number down to 45? Now that I've been so bold, he said, what if you make it for 45? Will you destroy the whole city for that many, if we can find 45? And God says, okay, 45 people, I won't destroy it. And Abraham's counting up, and he's like, Dang, I can't even get to 45 good people. All right, what if you make it 40? Slowly, by little by little, he starts to realize there's a lot of wickedness in the town, so much so that if he can find, he gets him to say, if you can get down to 10 people, God says, if you can find 10 people, I won't destroy it. 
and they couldn't even find 10 righteous people. Now, what's fascinating to me about this is this. Abraham knew this, and he wasn't talking to his cousin about it, to his primo. Lot was actually his nephew, but we're using the primo for the... He wouldn't talk to him about it. And I think that was a willingness. He said, well, that's not my problem over there. But here's the thing. We live in a world right now where a lot of people are suffering a lot of consequences of their own self-destructive tendencies. And a lot of times we go around, well, who am I to judge? I'm not going to say anything. And here's the thing. You can't willfully be blind. You can't ignore things that make you uncomfortable in the world around you because we are a light to the world. And there are a lot of people who are suffering. And we don't go into them. We say, repent of your sin because you're evil and wicked and I'm not. That's not what you're doing. You go in humbly and you say, hey, listen, you know a lot of the pain that you're struggling with? Man, I've been there. And it's because you haven't been living in harmony with what God's word says. But here's the thing. God asks these things of us for our good. And I want this for your good. And this is the mistake we make. We use the Bible as a sword to whack people's heads off. But you know you can use a sword to also point the way. Through you and you say, man, I've really messed up my life. I I'm, I'm feel so weak from all the things I've done and hurt, hurting my body and hurting my emotions and everything. Well, God's saying, listen, then here's the good news. You, you're not going to be depending on your strength for this to happen. Then you're going to be depending on my strength. And that's how it's actually going to happen. But you've got to obey. You've got to be willing to step out into the place that you don't know where you're going. And then finally, I would say obedience is greater than any of your failures. You may have messed up your life. You may have destroyed your relationships, destroyed your finances, and you're looking at your life, you're saying, I didn't think it was going to be this bad at this point in my life, but here's the thing, it's not too late. Because as soon as you start to obey what God says, he'll put you on the path to accomplishing the dreams you thought could never happen. You even thought it was maybe too late. It's too much water under the bridge. It's too late for this. But it starts with this one simple act of obedience. And the way you do it is you get up every morning and you say, Lord, I need your strength to live today. I'm not going to lean on my own ability to figure this out. I'm not going to depend on my own self. Show me what I'm supposed to do today. Read your Bible, pray, and listen for what he says to do. And then go do it. And you take one step. You say, well, it's still impossible. There's no way our marriage could be restored. Well, do the one step today. And then tomorrow, get up and do the next step that God tells you to do. And listen. And one step at a time. Remember, it's a long journey. But even if you've messed things up and you've worked against God's principles, if you'll start on the path to obedience, God will say about you just what he said about Abraham. Hey, you, you're being faithful. And the beautiful thing is, man, he, will, he can take even the biggest mess ups, which all of us are, and he can do amazing things through you when you obey. And that's the cool part about all this. In the end, it's really not about you. It's about what God can do through you if you'll surrender your life to him and recognize you're going to make a mess of things just like Abraham did, but it doesn't mean that's your destiny. Your destiny is achieving all God put in your heart because he's the one that's going to accomplish it. And that's how you let your light shine before men that they will see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. Anything good that he does in your life is so that it'll ultimately point to him because they're going to look at you and say, well, you're a mess. Yes, I am a mess, but I did my best to obey God. And I did some dumb things along the way, but I did my best to obey God. And, then, and that's when God, you stand before God and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. That's that eternal perspective we're living for. We're living for the day when we stand before God. And he says to us, good job. And you go, man, but I messed up so much. He's like, ah, you know what? I don't see those mess ups because Jesus covered that. Jesus paid the price for the sins in your life. He's asking you now to just the best of your ability, obey him one day at a time and take the step. And that's what we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks. How to pursue the dreams God put in your heart to accomplish them and how to avoid making some, creating some unnecessary suffering in your life. Next week, my friend John James, he was a founder of the, a band called the Newsboys. And uh, he hit the heights, man. I mean, they arrived. He was playing arenas of 30,000 people. And then he made some really bad decisions and he destroyed his life. But God restored him. So he's going to tell that story next week. So don't miss that. He's a great dude. And um, let me pray for you guys. Lord, we if you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. 
May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.